Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. So this is the second episode of this week, doubling up. Probably see that, you know, maybe one or two more times here throughout August. Got a lot of stuff I want to get out here and just uh, trying to fit it all in before everyone takes off on their Western hunting trip. So a lot of Western focus here coming up and that'll switch over to a little bit more of a mountain buck whitetail hunting theme as we, uh, you know, approach October. But anyways, the podcast is presented by Onyx. So the, what I want to talk about Onyx uh, at the beginning of this episode here is their trail feature. So one of the layers that you can turn on with Onyx has to do with the trail systems. So whether you're in Pennsylvania or you're in Colorado and Elk Hunt, whatever it is, if there's marked trails there, they will be marked on Onyx. And you can turn on the trail slope feature to be able to tell the steepness and everything else associated with that trail. So so when you're looking at it, they have it color coded. When you see the trail that's running up, say it's running up a ridge or a valley, the green section of the trail is, you know, less of a slope, a little bit more flat as it turns yellow and gets into red. That's when you know it's getting steeper. So a lot of times it's tough to tell, even with topographical lines, to be able to tell how steep something is. But this trail markers really help out, and you can tell what's a difficult trail and what's not. Just kind of get yourself, you know, prepared for that. And in addition to that, it'll show the mileage. So between, you know, two intersections of a trail, it'll tell you how many miles it is on that. So that's really helpful, and I use that a lot for like kind of. Figuring out how much time it's going to take me to get from one point to another is looking at the trail grade as well as the distance. So that's a cool feature that Onyx has. If you want to check out the Onyx Hunt app on your phone and your computer, you can use the code EMW to save 20% off of that. And that's the code EMW. Check that out at onyxmaps.com. The University of Elk Hunting. So Corey Jacobson and Elk 101 have put together the most comprehensive elk hunting course available. Anyone from beginners to experts, elk hunters can learn from this course. And it's it's really important, you know, this time of year, you know, I'm past the, the planning phase for the most part. Still doing scouting, that kind of never stops up to the day I leave. But I'm using a lot of the, the elk behavior section of this is what I'm been i've went through it now three times just this year alone learning about you know elk's behavior and how they move throughout the day some different things tips and tactics some common misconceptions and mistakes that elk hunters normally make a lot of really good information in this course so if you want to check out the university of elk hunting at elk101.com Use the code East Meets West. Save yourself twenty dollars on a year membership to the course. Next, Maven Optics. So Maven has you know come out with the highest quality optics available at half the price of their competitors to so their direct consumer business model. And what they're able to do with this, you know, this business model of you know sending the product directly from them to you is allow thousands of customizable options. You can change colors on just about anything with these optics and even get your name engraved in it. Whatever, you know, floats your boat, you can probably do it. So I I've customized both my B2s and my new S2 spotting scope. So it's basically, you know, one of a kind unless someone else picked the same options. It's pretty cool to be able to see that. If you want to check out Maven Optics at mavenbuilt.com, use the code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT to get yourself a free gift with any full price optics order. And lastly, Heather's Choice. Last week, you know, we talked to Sean Jerky from Alpen Fuel and talked about, you know, high quality food options. And Heather's Choice definitely is one of those options that I don't go on a trip without. 
high quality, high calorie, high fat, high protein foods available and dehydrated options. So they're healthy for you and also give you the fuel and you know, proteins to be able to recover at the end of a long day and keep going for day after day after day on a hunt. So that's really important, especially with, you know, when you're, you know, going on those week long, two week long trips, it's, it can be really helpful. If you use the code East meets West at checkout, you'll save yourself some money with free shipping on any orders over $99. And if you just want to try something smaller, still go over to our partners page on the website or in the show notes here. Click on the link that helps show support for the podcast as well. So this episode I'm getting into with Ben Denamonte from Shed Crazy. If you are familiar with Ben, he's hilarious uh, on his Instagram page and his YouTube channel. And is really an extremely knowledgeable guy. And we talk a little bit here about, you know, his story behind Shed Crazy and how he's able to do that full time now. How he set himself up financially for success in, you know, life and hunting, as well as some cost saving tips for out of state hunts. You know, and then we dive into Utah, which is his home state, some over the counter opportunities. One thing that was really interesting to me is the spike bull hunts, which he'll talk about and explain here, and also landowner tags. So what they mean, explain how that can really expand your options of getting some quality tags, you know, that otherwise you may not be able to get through the draw system or anything else. So this podcast is really valuable and Ben is just a really good guy. He's he's just straight up crushing it. So I think uh, everyone will enjoy this about a week out or a week (laughs) i wish it was a week about a month out from you know from me heading west to idaho with mason and michael and also justin mueller behind the camera it's gonna be great and super pumped about that hunt so it's just a lot of preparing going through gear and shooting and fitness and everything else it's gonna be a pretty great time so excited about that so without further ado, let's jump into this episode here with Ben. All right, we're back. Another episode of the East Meets West Hunt Podcast. And I'm back again at the Total Archery Challenge with Ben Dedamonte. Yeah, dude, nailed it. Dude, I got the last name <laughs> down. Uh, we were practicing that for a little while here. Yeah. For some reason, Ben, you're even struggling with you know pronouncing. Your I think last I was about name. yeah 14 maybe when I learned how to say it. So it's kind of a t- <laughs> kind of a tough one spelling. Hopefully that'll be next year. I'll learn how to spell it. But yeah. So what's going on, man? I'm just out here enjoying this event, man. It's a pretty cool place. I've never been out here to PA before. Yeah. And uh, I'm impressed. I like it. Cool. It's uh, a little more heavily wooded than Utah, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm used to being able to kind of like see. Yeah. You know, a little ways around, but uh, even when you're in town here, it feels like you're kind of in the middle of nowhere closed off so it's yeah cool. yeah it is it is a pretty uh unique place i've never been to utah myself so i can't but i just some of the other places in the west it's just so big and makes you feel kind of so small right there you know yeah or here's a little bit more closed in but so what brings you here for total archery challenge so i'm working with a company called canvas cutter out here uh, just helping them with the event um running a little bit of their booth for them and just hanging around meeting a lot of cool people that go to these events and uh meeting some people from out here shooting yeah just kind of getting out and seeing the world yeah man it's uh what, what's i guess what's your impressions on on this event specifically with total archery challenge it's a lot of it's a lot of fun like i think it's cool to be, it's a little more mellow than some of them i've been to um some of them get a little bit chaotic especially the utah events and the west events and plus the hiking can be pretty strenuous on them this one seems kind of laid back the courses aren't going to be too strenuous and just seems like a good crowd too when you think pennsylvania i mean at least for me the first thing i thought wasn't hunters mm-hmm. then you get out here and you realize there's a lot of diehards out here yeah and the numbers i mean it's crazy yeah i mean we definitely have a pretty high population of people you know around some of the major areas but i mean pennsylvania has the number one as far as the amount of hunters in any other state that's so cool which is it's crazy it's crazy to think about but 
and uh, that, that's I, I want to go to a Western um, TAC event really bad just to yeah. see it. Yeah, and and you know shooting those those trains and w- it's hiking fun. around. Yeah, you need to come out for sure. Yep, I'll have to, I'll definitely have to schedule some time to be able to do that. But anyways, Ben, so do you want to give a little background on who you are, why you're here? Yeah. Um, so my name is Ben Dedamonte, as we said earlier. Um, I grew up in Utah, and um, I basically do social media for a living, hunting social media. Um, I've been doing it full time for about two and a half years. I just have an Instagram and a YouTube channel, put out a couple of videos a week on YouTube and keep up pretty constantly on Instagram. And um, I get a chance to work with some really cool companies and uh, just have kind of like a, I don't know, a blessed lifestyle, man. Yeah. I'm just super lucky to get to do this full time. It's like when I say it, it sounds dumb almost, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's your job. Like, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. So, is but it, it's is fun. Is it funny, like, when you explain or explain to older people and oh, stuff? Oh, they like, can't fathom it. They, they, don't they have get, no like, idea. so you're a guide. I'm like, no, I'm not a guide. <laughs> like, you hunt for a living? I'm like, yeah, hunt for a living, but you're not a guide. I'm like, no. So, I don't know. Yeah. Isn't that funny how that works out? We, uh, I, that's my, my grandparents, when I started the podcast, wait, so what, what is it? So like, what now? What, what are these followers you're talking about? <laughs> talk radio, grandma and grandpa. Yeah. 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 Talk radio. Radio show. Uh-huh. See you guys. Um, but yeah, it's like, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. It's but, funny. Um, anyways, so what is your, uh, what's the name of your brand? That you've created? Yeah. So everything is under the name shed crazy. I really got into it through shed antler hunting. I got obsessed with it about five years ago just really crazy on it and started growing some social media platforms started growing instagram started making youtube videos and it kind of took off a little bit to where i've been able to do to do what i want now um sell some apparel uh, work some events so just a little bit of everything yeah was that something that was kind of your plan with it from the beginning like you were hoping to get to this point oh not at all it wasn't even something i considered i started doing it just because it was something i was obsessed about and uh, i started posting about it and then the light kind of turned on for me when i started to get like um some interest in sponsorships and things like that started to get some companies sending me product and then started to make a little bit of money i'm like oh man i could really turn this into a career Mm -hmm. and it kind of clicked over for me too when i started involving a little bit more humor into what i do um i started out fairly serious just like i try to do like high quality photos and stuff which i sucked at probably (laughs) still suck at but my wife one day told me she's like you have to you have to show people like who you really are you have to crack some jokes or it's not going to ever do anything and she was right as soon as i started just being dumb and being myself it just started to go places yeah no that's awesome yeah it's, it's funny. That's uh, some of the people that I, I talk to that, that listen to the podcast and their stuff. They'll they'll mention certain episodes. They're like, "Were you drunk in that episode or what?" <laughs> like you're just. I'm like, when I get around people that I, especially that I know that are friends, sure. like, you really can be your yourself right. when you start talking. And yeah. I'm always just a dumbass when it comes <laughs> down to it. And, and they're like, we like those episodes. It's just, you know, yeah. funny. Yeah, I think everybody relates to it, and I, and I love that, and I love to bring that back to hunting a little bit because. It's so serious, you know. If you were to just, like, watch social media, you'd think we're just, like, unhappy people, right? Yeah. Just, like, suffering and, <laughs> you know. But the funnest thing about hunting to me is just getting out with your buddies, screwing around, having a good time, giving each other shit, and just, just having fun together. Yeah, that's 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 so true. And I, I, that's what I love. And using, uh, I guess, p- positive humor that's, right. you know what I mean, as far as not just always bashing on right. people. Yep. If, unless yeah, there's it's a line. A, Definitely. There's definitely a lot. There's there's a fun way to bash on people right. that's like, you know, funny but Yeah, it's gotta be able to fill it out and know, not target people, you know, and, and I always laugh. I always try to crack jokes in a way that makes people feel like they can laugh as well, even yeah. if the joke's about them. And when people come at me, you know, people say stuff about me all the time and crack jokes and if it's funny I'll for sure just like give them a pass and like, Yeah, all right, that's all, as long as it's funny, I'm golden, I don't care. <laughs> but if it's not funny, then I'm going to come at you hard. <laughs> I'm going to come back at you. <laughs> so what's it, um, I guess, what's it like when you made that transition? Like, how did you decide, like, now I'm going to jump? Um, a lot of it was where we were at financially. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife and I decided that we were going to get 100% out of debt. Uh, we jumped on the Dave Ramsey train super hard. I know we chatted a little bit earlier about it. Um, but we decided to just get completely out of debt and we decided to go all in Uh, at the time we owned a home uh we owned she had a brand new car i had a big nice truck four-wheelers motorcycles just all the regular debt that people have 
And we decided we didn't want any of that because we were unhappy. We were living paycheck to paycheck, even though we were making plenty of money. And so we actually decided to sell our house. We sold our house, and that got us a big head start on getting out of debt. And then I started working extra, started working late, picked up night shifts. So I was working two jobs. She was working a lot. Tried to throw everything we had into getting rid of our debt. And over the course of about six months, we paid off like something like $30,000 in debt. And we're done. We got totally out of debt. And um, my wife got a better job, and I saw the same job. So we started getting really comfortable. And we were living on two pretty good incomes. And we realized, like, if we get comfortable living on two incomes, we're never going to be able to, like, break away. And she didn't want her to quit her job. She loved her job. So she told me, she's like, why don't you just quit your job? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, this was starting to grow. It was becoming a possibility for a career. And so she just, we were driving one day. And, well, she basically told me she was sick of me, like, bitching and moaning that I wanted to hunt all the time. Yeah. She's like, well, either shut up about it forever or do it. So I called my boss right then when we were driving, put in my two weeks and two weeks later I was trying to do YouTube. So Man, that's all so the YouTube were you doing YouTube before this? No, so I really started YouTube the week I quit my job. Like the first YouTube video I ever put up was me like quitting my job, like the last day at work, clocking out, walking out. And then just kinda of telling everybody what my plan was for trying to get this done. And uh, since then, I've done, I think I've maybe 220, 230 YouTube videos. And, uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. And that's uh, that's nothing like really putting yourself out on the line as sure. far as, like, this is make or break. Right. You know, I quit my job. Now it's time to make it, make it happen, you know? Yeah, I think you have to say it to the universe. I think you have to, like, say, I'm doing it. And I was surprised how many people stepped up and supported me right off the bat. Just, like, from people who were just watching the videos um, to people that I had known from companies just came through for me right in the beginning to help me get that initial push. And it was a huge help. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I think I started following your stuff. It was probably maybe, when, when did you go full time? This you said two years would, ago? Yeah, it would have been January of 2016, 2017. Okay. I don't know, two and a half years ago. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, 20, 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I found you sometime in 2016, maybe, is when I, like, literally, I was oblivious to the whole Western side of anything yeah. until, actually, I, I read Cameron Haynes' book, Backcountry Bowhunting, uh -huh. and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of cool things that are, you know, going on out there. Then all of a sudden, with social media, mm -hmm. I was opened up to a whole bunch of stuff going on out there, and I came across this crazy guy that was out there picking up sheds, cracking jokes, but... <laughs> And that's, that's pretty early on. Yeah, that's that's awesome to be able to see that kind of that growth like that and just taking risks, but calculated risk from the sounds of it with you know getting yourself financially set for it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and you and I had were talking earlier um, when you were kind of asking me about the podcast and everything behind it and about how if people looked at their finances a little differently they can go on hunts oh absolutely every year you know yeah and that was what i did i did that for a long time because i'd never have been like a real big money guy you know i was just a normal dude on normal income and I always wanted to i was always spending the majority of my disposable income disposable income on gear and hunts and i think that that's something that is pretty cool i don't think people realize how much money they just walks out of their budget if they're not intentional with their money. Mm -hmm. I hear people all the time. That's the number one, the number one excuse I hear for people saying like, Oh, I can't afford to hunt. I can't afford to hunt. I can't afford to hunt. But when we broke down our budget, when we were getting out of debt, that's one thing I realized is there's so much expendable income in there that you're just letting walk away if you're not intentional with your budget. Yeah. And you can turn that, that budget, that money into all kinds of hunts and opportunities. And I don't know. There's a lot of a lot of ways you can go about it that people don't really think about typically. Yeah, can you kind of explain a little bit of what you some things that you have done or you would recommend to people to do as far as like looking at that from the financial side of things? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I would do is write down everywhere your money goes for two weeks, everything you spend money on, all your money that comes in, all your money that goes out, and it's really better to do it probably over the course of a month because that's people's budget cycle for the most part, you know. But for a month, write in all the money you bring in and everything you spend money on. And then you go through and just start looking at things that are completely unnecessary. All of us have them, right? And, you know, things like Netflix, right? You're going to pay 10 bucks a month for Netflix. How much time do you really watch Netflix? Well, maybe a lot, maybe a little. But, you if know. If you're watching a lot. Maybe it's worth it, right? <laughs> yeah, or figure out 
something to do right go outside tv (laughs) right yeah and and that's good too to look at it from that point of view another thing for me which is like was like gas station food right when i wrote down and we broke down our whole budget i spent like a few hundred dollars a month just like when i was driving i stopped at the gas station grab some food or like fast food and stuff like that and it's really easy to cut that in like half but as long as you kind of know like where your money's going then you can start to make it do what you want it to do and cut out the little things and start to build savings or eliminate debt and you can get yourself in a lot better situation financially really fast yeah it's and it's crazy i mean like like you were talking about like the gas station foods and stuff i can't tell you how many people i've talked to when they go on say a western hunt even this is just you know on the way to the hunt but the whole way they'll drive from the east 25 26 hours and they eat out of a gas station the oh, yeah. whole way out there you can spend a couple hundred dollars doing that easily where if you pack them you put them in a cooler you have right. some make some wraps or sandwiches and and stuff like that you can be yeah you so can save better. all kinds of money like that another thing that like you can do is just a whole bunch of research on over-the-counter units and stuff is obviously super helpful. But if you can save money on dumb things on you go on your hunts like hotels, like you can save so much money on a trip if you just like figure out a way to not stay in a hotel. Like the, the bedroll that we use is awesome for that. If you just have a sleeping bag, you're talking about always crashing in your car, sleeping in the yeah. front seat of your truck. Like whatever you got to do to save that 100 bucks a night is just, I don't know. People don't realize you can do it so much cheaper than most people do it. Well, and, think, and even, okay, say you did get a hotel for 100 bucks a night, which is actually probably on the lower end. Right. Especially what I figured out without, West well, say, September Elk. A lot of those places, and I'm going to reference Colorado because that's what I've experienced in, but that's a tourist time because the leaves are changing. Right. Hotel prices are higher than that. Mm-hmm. And then you add in whether the hotel includes breakfast or not. You right. add a little bit of that, those fees into it. And, mm-hmm. and there's, there's a lot more that starts to add up. And you're talking about the bedroll from Canvas Cutter, right? That's what you use a lot? Yeah, yep. And that's just, explain a little bit what that is. Just So it's a sleep system, basically. It's a canvas bedroll. You put a sleeping bag and a pillow. It has a pole system. You can sleep in any kind of weather comfortably, basically. You leave all your sleeping gear rolled up in it, and it's just going to keep the elements out, going to keep the dust and the dirt out of your bed when you leave for the day. And it's just one minute of setup. And I always tell people, you can buy the thing for three nights in a hotel, right? And then you've got it forever. And when people come out west, there's just an immense amount of public land. And you can just camp instead of going into town and getting a hotel. Like, there's public land in a lot of places. Colorado is a good example. Like, some places right on the edge of the town, there's places that you can go camp. And so go camp for three nights and go get a hotel for one and shower and, and do what you need to do. So it's uh, there's a lot of money to be saved just through tweaking the way you do things. And I'd rather have a bedroll than three nights in a motel room, you know? Yeah. And at least you walk away with something you can use forever. Yep. I, I like that that mindset with it. Have something that you can physically use an investment rather than money you'll never see again. Right. Yeah, hotel money, that's just gone. Yeah, and that's what, you know, I, mine's a little bit different, but I've been sleeping now in a rooftop tent. Yeah. And been doing that for some occasions. Man, that's so awesome. Yeah, it can be an, an upfront cost. Right. Which is expensive. And, you know, whether that's a, a canvas cutter, cutter bedroll or you're using a tent. Right. Or you're using truck tent whatever it is that's you you have that you know what i mean yeah it's yours forever instead of just walking out of a hotel room with just maybe like bed bugs (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's the things you're gonna get out of a hotel room are things you don't want to do yeah diseases right free (laughs) shampoos i guess but (laughs) (laughs) you're you're one of those guys that have the big collections oh dude i don't even care about them i'm like yeah (laughs) i take my own my own shampoo (laughs) Yeah, I know. I, I actually do that myself. Yeah. You got to be stay looking fresh, dude. And that stuff doesn't do it. It's not high quality enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. With that big beard that you have, you yeah, have, to, you have dude, to keep it. For sure. You got to keep nourished. it luxurious. Soft. It turns into barbed wire if you don't. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot. Of, I mean, you can do so much just with like making little bit decisions, little intentional decisions. You'd be amazed how much like stress and pressure it takes off of your budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, well, we were talking again earlier. I was, I've been meeting with Jeff Bynum, um, who does, he was on Dan Staten's Elk Shape podcast where I heard him, and he's been meeting with me to help figure out my financial things. And, you know, he had me do that where you did the exercise of laying out everything, you know, I'm spending money yeah. on and, and 
looking at it and looking at where my money's going and what's coming in and yeah, you can cut yeah. so many costs in places I was spending stupid subscription money on things. Right. I had Sirius Radio that I used I used um I well one, I mostly listen to podcasts where right. I had music on my phone. I never used Sirius and I was paying uh six or seven bucks a month for right. that. And Netflix mm-hmm. and all these other little tiny things that add up. Yeah, for sure. And you think a few bucks a month for like oh iTunes or whatever, it's no big deal. It's not a big deal, but you could also be using that money for something that would mean a lot to you. Yeah. Instead, so yeah, gym memberships for me are like the freaking worst, man. Because I'll get a gym membership, you know, and I'll go like super hardcore for like a month, and then I'll just put it on the back burner, or I'll start hunting or whatever. And over the course of the year, yeah, I'll pay fifty bucks a month for a gym membership for the whole year to go really for like one month. Yeah. And I'd be better off to just figure out a way to exercise at home during that month that I'm going to get really serious before the hunts. Yeah. And I don't know. So there's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. And it's probably, it comes down to, yeah, what your priorities are with it. There's right. some things you're not going to be able to cut out for or sure. say you, you know, you do want to go to the gym all the time and you do use it a yeah. lot. Then that's, that's a, a great thing. It's a great investment yep. yourself or, but if you're not, or say, the only thing you use is Spotify, then okay, yeah, that's that's different. We're not saying cut everything out of your life, but right. there's things you can definitely cut out. Yeah, by me doing that exercise, I think I cut out, it was like somewhere around $40 a month. Uh-huh. You add that up over, I think I had figured it out, I think it was over two years I had an elk hunt paid for mm-hmm. just in that. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. Yep. Anybody can figure out a way to cut forty dollars a month. Oh, for you know. sure, yeah. And if you do that for, I mean, you forty bucks a month for a year is going to get you a Utah on resident like over the counter elk tag. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's your tag. There's a fee covered, and then it's just figuring out the logistics of your trip. And you really do that for a couple of years, you got a hunt taken care of. So it's pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah, it really is. And and like you said, then then it comes down to the priorities of what what you want. Is going hunting really important to you? Yeah. Then, figure it the fuck out right you know hey man that's the way it is like i think serious hunters i don't know maybe it's not maybe it's like this for everybody but it seems like if you have something that you're super passionate about you have to prioritize it i see a lot of guys who are spread across a million hobbies you know i have tons of my friends who like oh yeah they like to hunt but they fly fish and they do all these other things and it's like those are all great hobbies and they're all well and good but you have to be intentional if you want it to be what you want it to be you know if you're going to be an obsessive hunter dedicate the money and the time and the energy to make it what you want it to be mm-hmm. it's it's funny i really want to get into i've really wanted to get into fly fishing but i won't because yeah. i can't have another hobby i get obsessed with things and i know that it's not and i'll end up spending too much money on mm-hmm. the stuff too much time and if i want to be successful hunting whitetails in pennsylvania i need to be scouting all the time and yeah. and doing other things there or, or getting ready for an elk hunt or whatever that might be yeah. hunting is is my thing you know yeah, me too and i've had to cut out other things to make that happen you know yep. unfortunately well my yep. bow's almost blowing over here in the booth. Yeah, we're getting some tornado force winds coming through. <laughs> but, yeah, 100, 100%, I agree with, with that priority thing. And that's that's not, probably one of the number one things that bothers me when people say that. Like, oh, I wish I had your kind of money. Like, yeah. what's my kind of money? Right. I don't, <laughs> do you see a big giant house I'm living in? Yep. No. <laughs> yeah, and that's true, man. You have to, to a degree, minimalize your lifestyle to make it what you, you know, to, to put your funds where you need them to be in order to do what you want. It's, uh, people look at me a lot and they like think I'm a schmuck, you know, because I live in a rental home. It's a fine home, you know, it does everything we need it to. It's a rental. And where I come from, it's like when you're a grown up, you buy your house or you build your house, right? And then like we drive cars, reliable older cars. We'll always just pay cash for older cars. That's the way, I mean, until, unless we had gobs of money for some reason, that's what we do. And people think we're poor. They think we're poor. It's like, no, we just do what we want with our money instead of spending it on everyday expenses. Yep. So. Yeah, that is that is the, the one part that I'm trying to figure out right now because I do have a truck payment. And that's, you know, I'm like, I need a reliable vehicle. Right. And there's like a, there's a line there trying to figure out what's, what you need. And, and, yeah. and, and also just trying to, uh, I guess, convince yourself that you and once you go away from it, you realize you don't need those things yeah. as much as you think you do. Yeah, but. you get used to standard of living, and that's super hard to break away from having, like, a nice truck. Yeah. I, 
I was the same way with you as far as when I got out of when I got out of college and got my first real job, I guess, like full time job. I went. I think the first month I bought a big lifted truck, and then I. Then six months later, I bought a razor mm-hmm. side by side, and I had you know, I retired the big red three wheelers we were talking <laughs> about earlier, and bought a side by side and yeah. it out, and and I started looking at it. I'm like, how am I making good money, decent money, and have living paycheck to paycheck, yeah. and um, don't have anything to show for it? And I'm like, all right, I need to figure some shit out here. So, you know, I I paid off that. My side by side, I sold that, took the money from that, and paid off my truck awesome. at the time. And then, well, then the truck ended up having problems. I sure. got another one, but still, right? Just I started paying off one thing at a time, and then that money that I was normally spending on that monthly payment, I could put off on the next one. And right. Start. Call it the debt snowball, man. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what we did too. We sold some vehicles, sold some things, and just started rolling the cash we were paying on everything. Just went smallest to biggest on our debts. You know, we had a few small debts like. There's some doctor bills and some small credit cards. We attacked those first. Once those were paid off, all the money that was going into those started going to the next biggest debt. And, like, it was pretty crazy. Like, one day we wrote, like, a four or $5,000 check for the last of our car, and that was it. Yeah. And we're like, wow. Okay. Like, that happened way faster than we thought it was going to happen. Yeah. And then, like, we started saving because part of the Ramsey plan is you need to have a, uh, six months income in savings. Yep. So we started building that. And then it's like we got to where we had that in the bank. And then that was pretty much the point that I that I jumped and quit my job because it's like, where's the risk now, you know? If mm-hmm. this doesn't work out, I got six months to figure it out at the very least. Yeah. So. If, I, if yeah, if all completely fails and you make zero dollars in that time frame, yep, you have, I have six an income months. for six months. And I knew I was capable of getting a job again, no problem, if that was what happened. So kind of takes the fear away from it. Yeah. And so did you, did you say you tackled the debt before you put that, that savings in place or Uh, so what you do first is you put a thousand bucks in the bank to begin with, right? The first thing you do, that's called your emergency fund, your starter emergency fund, right? You put the thousand in, then you start attacking the debt, but you never touch that thousand. That's always your safety, your safety blanket. And then once you get done with your debt, you build six months income and savings. And then actually Ramsey carries on and has like a whole investing you know, like an amount that you put into IRAs and things if you want to follow it. We haven't gone that hardcore into the investing end of it. But once you get your savings all built up, then he tells you how to start investing and saving for retirement, basically. Okay. So we probably ought to tackle that end of it next. Yeah. Because hunting industry, like, I don't think Instagram's giving me any retirement money. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I I, I understand that. Yeah, that was an interesting thing that Jeff was, you know, talking to me about. And I, I don't know enough about it to talk about it in detail here, but basically, you know, Pay, making sure that you're putting, I, I can't remember that his like rule of thumb was anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of what you're making for savings in some way. You yeah. Know? Yep. And it was it was a really cool way and just like putting a percentage on what you should be spending on a, if you were going to have a mortgage or rent and what you should be spending on that. You know, I'm yeah. I'm not a person that wants a big house, anything like that. Yeah. I don't I don't need Same. that. Yeah, I'm not worry. married either, so maybe yeah. if I had a wife that did, it'd be a little harder Might to change, yeah. figure it out. But <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that's cool. I, I'm glad we, you know, got into that subject a little bit, and just want to really drive that point home. Like you guys can make, you guys or girls can make this stuff happen and yeah, go on absolutely. some pretty awesome adventures. There's no way. I brought this up again before on the podcast, but I had a guy by the name Matt Comment on. Do you know Matt at all? Did you ever hear the name? Uh, Matt? Yeah, Matt Comment. He's from Virginia. I don't think so. But he's done, like, some sheep hunts and some, like, pretty cool, like, big hunts. And he's, he works in the construction industry yeah. and doesn't own his own construction company or anything. But he's figured out a way on how to save for these hunts and he doesn't, you know, doesn't live an extremely fancy life or anything. And he told me, he goes, well, when I bought my new truck, it wasn't a new truck, but a newer truck, he sent me a text and he goes, you're driving your sheep hunt, joking around. And I was like, oh shit. And when he, we did that podcast here last year, the total archery challenge, he goes to me, he goes, when you buy say a newer truck or a toy, he goes, that's cool for like, that's, that's instant gratification. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. You can show it off. Mm-hmm. It's cool for a little bit. Okay. Right. In 40 years, are you going to remember that truck or that toy you bought? 
or are you going to be talking about that hunt you went on right. and the experiences you had? He goes, those experiences just grow with time right. where those just depreciate. You know, the value of a vehicle or a, uh, some sort of toy or big house, those, those depreciate over time. Yep. Yeah, and that's part of the Ramsey deal, too, is, like, you give up what you want most or what you want now for what you want most. And then, like, the other big thing that I would, like, the credence I try to live by is just buy experiences, not things, because things go away, you know. They don't define you, but the thing, the places you go are yours forever, you know. Yeah, I, I could not agree anymore on that. So the other thing I kind of want to talk to you about, Ben, is you do a lot of Utah over-the-counter hunting, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I dove into Utah this year trying to learn when I was going to try to build some points there and mm-hmm. stuff, and I just got super frustrated complicated. and complicated with it. And I'm like, I'm you know, spending my money elsewhere. And, yeah. and But you were telling me about some over-the-counter opportunities and kind of wanted to hear a little bit of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so Utah has some opportunity over-the-counter for sure. Um, elk. Um, there are a few units in Utah that are any bull, any legal bull. So actually in the archery hunts, there are any, a lot of them are any elk. You can shoot a bull or a cow, a spike bull, whatever. There's no minimum requirement on size on the bull. Um, and there's a couple of those in the Southern end of the state. And then a few of those in the Northern end of the state. They're typically pretty difficult units. Um, the success rates are fairly low. Um, but the elk are there and if you put in a lot of work or if you were to have maybe an archery deer tag in the same unit you can be hunting at the same time so a lot of people will add them on in that scenario Mm -hmm. the coolest thing about it is that they have um, spike and cow tags also available on a lot of the premium entry limited entry elk units so you as a over-the-counter hunter can go buy that tag and hunt the best units in the state and shoot a cow or a spike so you can buy that tag and then um, if you're on a unit that borders one of the any bull units, that tag's valid um, for either side. So, like, you could take your spike tag and go over to the general side and shoot a big bull if you were to encounter one over there, you know. Uh, okay. So, there's actually a lot of flexibility and opportunity with it. The season's about a month long, and you can pick. I mean, you could go out and hunt the end of it, where you can maybe get into a little rut action, or actually starts early enough, you could actually get a chance at a velvet bull, which is pretty rare yeah. in these places. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So I, I, I guess I didn't know that as far as the, the spike uh-huh. bull thing that you can hunt some of the premium units and have probably a freaking awesome experience. Yeah, and that's the cool things. You can get up where there's high elk numbers. You can see a lot of elk, spend a lot of time chasing elk, and um, experience like a true elk hunt. The bull that you can legally kill is going to be a spike, you know, but you can see some giant bulls. And for a first time, especially an archery elk hunter, it's a really hard hard thing to beat because you're going to see so many elk yeah um and that's the flexibility isn't quite as good that's pretty much archery um if you go to rifle you have to pick you can't hunt both sides with the same tag the open and the spike side but um with the rifle you pick uh i believe and i believe they're starting now to where you have to pick a unit that you're going to hunt for spikes as well okay where before it was pretty much statewide and archery i think is still pretty much statewide okay so there's a lot of opportunity on elk there. And general season deer tags in Utah are pretty easy to draw mm-hmm. um, for non-residents, especially archery tags. So there's a lot of opportunity. You do have to buy your license to apply in Utah, which is a frustration for a lot of people because you're going to spend about 150 bucks on a license, whether you draw or not. Um, and then I think a, a resident deer tag um, is in the three, a $300 range and a res, or a non-resident, sorry, is in the $300 range and a non-resident elk tag is like in the five to $600 range. Okay. So not much different than pretty other standard. states. Pretty standard across the, the board there. Um, and, and the one thing that I guess I wish I would have known some of this information starting out because for me, I I've, have not killed, uh, an elk before. I don't care about size. Yeah. Like, I would shoot a spike bull. I want to shoot a bull. I had pass on cows, which kind of regret it sometimes because <laughs> I love elk meat. Yeah. My buddy that was here with me, he killed a elk in Colorado this past year. We were having elk burgers back yeah. at the house, and oh, it's good. Those are good. Yeah, it's way good. But to be able to go out there and hunt some of those premium units, get that experience, learn how elk act and mm-hmm. and i feel like that would reduce your learning curve a little bit and definitely yeah because you can get some really good rut activity on them you can go out there and see it it's kind of a win and a lose like it's definitely a win for people who are looking for opportunity if you draw a premium big bull tag in utah it kind of sucks because then you have a whole bunch of spike tag hunters running around during your hunt yeah. you know, and you're trying to chase big bulls and they're trying to get on the spikes but 
And, you know, if you just have courtesy towards the other hunters, obviously if I was a spike hunter on a unit like that and somebody had a big bull tag and, you know, we were moving on the same herd, I think I'd let the big bull guy go get his chance. Yeah. Especially because some of those units can be 10 to 12 point draws for, for big bull tags. Yeah. So it's, uh, but there is more opportunity than people tend to think in Utah. Um, there also is a three season option. You can buy a tag that allows you to hunt archery, muzzle or and rifle. So if you don't fill your archery tag, there's a chance that you can go back on the same tag and hunt a general rifle hunt later in the year on the same units. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. So there's a lot more opportunity there than people think. So the, the, the regular ones where you can shoot any elk in those units, when you said that they could be, you know, tough, low success rate, is that just because of the high hunter numbers? Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, an example of that would be, um, the one that I, that I like to hunt is in Southern Utah and it has single digit success rate. Mm -hmm. Um, it has a high amount of private property for Utah. I don't know, compared to what you guys are used to, maybe it's not. Yeah. There are a lot of places you can hunt public land, but the public land stuff gets really, um, hit pretty hard, but I've always been able to find elk on them. I've killed several bulls on those any bull units, um, okay. killed one bull in the mid three fifties on one of those units. So really you can get into some good animals. It's just about putting the work in and a lot of it too is being there in the week because most of the hunting pressure comes from the locals on the weekends. So if you plan a, tra a trip out there and you can hunt through the week, you're going to be able to kind of get away from people and have the potential to get into some more elk. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that say, say you had, I don't know, which is low on uh, as far as time, but say you had nine days total, you could go out, you travel Friday, Saturday, hunt Monday through Friday, right. and travel Saturday, Sunday Definitely. back. I'd plan on that for sure. Like yeah, even living in the area, I plan to hunt usually Monday through Friday. Yeah. That's what I like to hunt on those, those elk units with more pressure. And single digits, I mean, yeah, that's definitely not great, but a lot of units in Colorado are the same way. Yeah. The one I hunted was, I'm not going to give the exact number, because people probably look it up, but say anywhere between 5 and 9%. Yeah. And I still got into bulls there. I didn't uh -huh. kill one, but still got into them. Yeah. You know, there's, that's not that much different standard across the, no. you know, the U.S. And that's why I like really like the, the combination archery tag, too, because if you're not getting into elk on the open side you know on the any bull side you can always drive an hour to a premium bull unit yeah and, and go chase spikes and cows and be in the elk for sure so if you're getting burned out no action drive for two hours and and go hunt somewhere else yeah yeah that's that's cool i guess i again i didn't know that when you were saying as far as deer tags are generally easier to draw in some of those areas uh -huh. do you still have to like put in for that yeah so all the deer tags in utah are through the draw system they don't have any over-the-counter um and except for leftover tags, and there's only usually a few hundred of those. So, okay, um, you do have to apply. Like usually, applications are due in in March, I believe. Um, maybe it's the end of February. Um, and yeah, you put in an application online with the Utah Division. You pay your tag fee, and then um, put your credit card in, and they bill your credit card if you draw. Okay. But yeah, there's I think 30 something deer units statewide. Uh, archery tags are pretty easy to draw. Rifle tags are a little tougher muzzleloader are kind of in between yeah and so there's a lot of deer opportunity there as well and and most of them will so they'll take like a certain number of points or can you still draw them randomly you can randomly draw them yeah the points are kind of like a suggestion unless you have max points mm -hmm. and they don't mean a ton I, they're supposed to mean that you have a better chance of drawing a tag but you can always just randomly get lucky and pull a tag i drew an antelope tag in utah this year with two points Okay. So, I mean, it happens. Sometimes you just get lucky and pull them. I, I drew one of the better elk tags in Utah with zero points. So it really? just, sometimes you just get lucky. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can't you can't get the tags if you don't try. Yeah. And then apply with them. Yeah, somebody's got to draw them. Yeah, that's like this year I did that with New Mexico. It's, you know, that's 100% random mm -hmm. draw. And I just Fruit shot lottery. this guy. Yeah. Yep. Did you draw anything? No. Yeah. <laughs> but I could have. Yeah. <laughs> New Mexico is another pretty cool state, man. Like, there's a lot of, even this year, you, it's really easy to get a landowner tag in New Mexico if you want to hunt elk down there still. Mm -hmm. And fairly affordable, like when you look at, you know, a comparable elk hunt in another state. Really? Mm-hmm. When, when you say, is it uh, is there a, a lot of variability to price there on a landowner tag? Yeah, or? there is. A lot of it has to do with how good the unit is. Uh, I bought a landowner tag last year in New Mexico, a rifle bull tag um, in a tough unit. I paid 1000 bucks for the tag. Um, and then you have your state tag fees on top of that. So it was 1600 altogether for everything, but I ended up killing a bull and like having a good time down there. 
And uh, there's a whole, I mean, it, budget is different for everybody. There's a whole lot of tags in the two to $5,000 range. And then you can always find some archery tags in the 1000 to $2,000 range. So kind of sounds like a lot of money, but when you start adding, you know, for landowner tags, it's pretty inexpensive. Yeah. Huh. I guess, yeah, that was another thing I'd, what, I'd never looked into for that. It's for good Mexico. to use like a tag brokering service. Um, like, for example, Epic. I don't know if you heard of Epic Outdoors. Yeah, I've heard of them. So they broker a lot of landowner tags um, where they just kind of have a list of, you can tell them what you're looking for and they can find you something in your price range. Um, I think Go Hunt uh, is another tool that yeah. offers a lot of landowner tags. And then, um, yeah, I usually have a beat on a few tags too. So if guys are ever looking for landowners, especially New Mexico stuff, mm -hmm. like I usually have wind, I think right now, uh, I know of about 20 or so landowner tags that are available in New really? Mexico. Really? So. Huh. That's interesting. And yeah, I've used, and I, I do believe Go Hunt has that feature. I use Go Hunt for a lot of my scouting for units and stuff. And, and I just never looked at that and yeah. really understood what they were. Mm -hmm. So basically you're, you can pay for that tag to hunt, uh, like say someone's property. Well, there's or, two different types. There's a private land, like a landowner tag. And basically it depends what state you're in. So they're kind of all different. These tags I'm talking about in New Mexico are unit-wide tags. So they're given to a landowner who owns a certain amount of property, and he resells them, but they're unit-wide tags. And so you're not only restricted to their property unless the tag specifically says so. Oh, so you can still hunt the public lands in the area? Yeah, absolutely. Really? So okay. In Colorado, there's two different types. There's a private lands tag, there's a private lands landowner tag, and then a unit-wide landowner tag. So if you get a private lands landowner tag in Colorado... You got to, uh, I caught it. <laughs> There's stuff flying off my table here. <laughs> so if you get a private land, landowner tag in Colorado, you can hunt any private land that you want, that you can get access to with that tag. So usually the landowner will offer some sort of like, oh yeah, you can hunt our property if you buy this tag, but not always. Um, and then you can also buy unit wide landowner tags in Colorado. So you just kind of need to know what you're looking at and make sure you verify that before you buy one. Man, that's that's good information. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah, it's a different way to go about it. Maybe for guys who don't want to wait to draw, or somebody maybe who has a little bit more money, you can guarantee a hunt. Yeah, and and yeah, you can get some pretty good opportunities. Absolutely. By doing that. Yeah, and a lot of them will offer like an outfitted hunt with it. There's a lot of outfitters that will sell tags. So guys who are maybe not looking to go full do it yourself, there's chances, opportunities there. But I, I don't know. The best value obviously is just to pick up the tag and go do it, do it yourself. And yeah can do really well huh. on them that's yeah i guess again that's my uh negligence of not looking into it as much but i just thought landowner thought uh -huh. you hunted that person's property yep they can go either way cool all right what about um is there anything else that you, you think of like that that would be beneficial for someone looking to to do an elk hunt in the west like that um obviously colorado has a ton of over-the-counter opportunity that's a great a great place to start the elk numbers are super high um but it just depends i think people need to have a realistic view of their ability as a hunter and then there's no shame to me in going on an outfitted hunt at all mm -hmm. if you are inexperienced an outfitted hunt could be a great first time but there are some kind of in-between options like drop camp hunts yep where they'll pack you into the back country on horses or mules maybe set up a wall tent for you and you can kind of hunt from there it's kind of a middle of the road option between a guided hunt and a and an over the counter option okay. or like a, or like a do it yourself option. So awesome. Well, I think we're about to get completely annihilated by a storm here. There's a black cloud descending rapidly here. Yeah. So I think we'll probably wrap this one up here, man. <laughs> due to but, weather. <laughs> yeah, due to to a weather thing here, but uh Ben, so where can people find some more information on you and what you got going on? Uh so you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is shed crazy. Um that's what my YouTube channel is called as well. Uh, I have some apparel and things like that for sale on my website. It's all linked through social media, so social media is the way. Yeah, social media is the way, dude. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you again for coming on here and, and you know, put, giving this information out. Yeah. So Happy it's uh, it. anything that can help, you know, people do that and help keep hunting, just keep keeping on, I guess. Yeah, that's <laughs> what we're all trying to do is just help people enjoy the outdoors and, and uh, keep the sport growing. Yep, exactly. All right, man. Well, 
it was awesome meeting you here and getting to see you in person after following you for quite a while. It's funny how you you see everybody on social media, but you don't when, once you meet them, you feel like you know them a little right. bit, but not really, you know. Yeah, absolutely, I get it. <laughs> so cool. All right, dude. Well, we'll talk soon. Sounds good, man. Thanks, well. Yep. See ya. See ya. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.